years ago, a bunch of cavers from Nottingham got the fright of their lives when they came face to face with a human skull sealed in the wall of that cave. But that was just the beginning. Dozens of other human bones were discovered from at least 20 different people, making this one of the largest collections of human bones ever found in a cave in this country. And when they were radiocarbon dated, some of them were found to be Stone Age, nearly 5,000 years old. But the story gets even more intriguing. At least seven of the humans were newborn babies. And there were artefacts too. This bone pin and this strange worked antler. And there was a stash of Roman coins here too. How did they all fit together? What was going on here? Solving this prehistoric puzzle is going to take a lot of pretty extreme archaeology. And as usual, we've got just three days. Caves on a ridge in the Peak District in Derbyshire. Though it seems bleak and remote today, people probably lived somewhere around here in prehistory. It's a fantastic landscape, but we're interested in what's under it. Why do we reckon there are so many bones down that cave? Well, I can think of three reasons we might uh, have a collection there. One is it could be a dump of material just chucked into the hole over a period. It could be some sort of disease, you know, a pestilence or something, but you've got several periods there. I know what your third reason is going to be. It's ritual. Yeah, it? I mean, the other reason is it could be somewhere where people ritually deposit bones, you know, into the ground, into, into a cave. What do we know about them so far? Well, we've got some idea of the date range because you've got late Neolithic and early Bronze Age collection at one end, and we've got Iron Age at the other end, and you've got some Roman finds. So that's quite a long period represented. Andrew, you've already pulled an awful lot of bones out of this cave, haven't you? Are there likely to be any more there? I think there's going to be a lot more bones in there. We only recovered material from the surface of the deposits in the cave. We haven't yet dug into the deposits, and we're hopeful that there will be much more material coming out of those sediments. You really need a bigger sample of material, don't you? You need to get we more do. stuff out to, to see that, really, That's don't right, we? and we need, need to know exactly where it comes from yeah. in the cave. Yeah. <laughs> While Mick and Phil are going to be busy on the surface, the underground digging will be dark, wet and possibly hazardous for our cave archaeologists, Katie, Alice and Anise. Though they don't seem unduly concerned. Does my bum look big in this? <laughs> Cavers from the Pegasus Club who found the bones are helping us to get underground and haul spoil. Do you feel constricted in there? Yeah, I feel like a bit of a robot. Yeah. It's a bit difficult to move. You're but ready to go. Just about, yeah. Stick my passion. Good luck. Down a bit later. Katie, bring me back a bone. This cave is actually a series of chambers linked by narrow shafts. Bones have been found in two of them. Most were in Yorick chamber, where Katie and Alice are going. Anise is going to Flaccid, where Roman coins and pottery were also recovered. <laughs> Yorick chamber is 15 metres below the surface. Onwards and downwards in case. Oh, wow. The chamber's named after this chap, a human skull embedded in the wall of the cave. He's been here a while. Stalagmites don't grow overnight. Are you all right, Alice? Yeah, fine. Yorick's our rocky chamber, full of boulders and stones. One whole side of it's extremely unstable. 
And until the Pegasus cavers have made it safe, it's off limits. Oh, wow. Don't touch any of this stuff on this side here because the guys are still showing us up to make sure it's absolutely safe. <coughs> well, the reason that we're putting this shuttering in to try and stabilise this area, because under this metal plate, earlier on, we discovered um, an infant's skull. Yeah. But it's totally unstable to work on. Uh, so is it the still there? Or is it, it's is that... still, part of it's still there, yes. The larger part came out, but yeah. uh, the rest of it's still in situ. That's Can I have a look? that you're finding infant skulls, because they don't even survive very well on, in the ground, let alone oh, in all this rubble. Yeah. It's very almost lucky. as though they've been covered over with a large stone. And then all this uh, rubbish has fallen on them after. I don't know, or whether it's just coincidence. Yeah, it's just stunning, isn't it? Amongst all this, all this rubble that they haven't just been smashed to pieces. Yeah. I'm amazed that we're finding stuff like that. Alice and Katie can still search elsewhere in Yorick. Almost all of the human bones found so far came from this chamber. Now we just need to find more. Some of the bones already recovered from Yorick have been radiocarbon dated and it shows that they come from two distinct periods. The oldest is an adult skeleton from about 2500 BC, late Neolithic, with signs of a bizarre prehistoric practice. There are some indications around the knee joints that the rest of the leg was cut off, the lower part of the leg. When we look at these bones, we see fine cut marks. Oh, crikey. Around the knee joint. Yeah, yeah. You can see one running across there. Someone has been cutting through the tendons and ligaments to take this body apart. I mean, that sounds like, or the, the thing you could jump to a conclusion is that there's cannibalism. But it needn't be that. Presumably. It needn't be that. And it, in fact, this isn't where you would cut the body necessarily. You would choose the fleshy part at the top yeah. of the leg and you would find cut marks yeah. at this end of the bone. Bones from ten children, seven of them newborn, were also recovered from Yorick. And one of these was dated to about 600 BC in the Iron Age, about 2,000 years later than the other bones. What the heck are Iron Age people doing putting all these newly born babies into a It's tomb? very odd, isn't it? I've never seen anything like this before. I mean, one possibility, I suppose, is that it just doesn't survive anywhere else. This is very mm. thin, you know, very fine bone. You can imagine it might just disappear in, mm. in other sort of environments other than in the cave. We're mm. just not seeing it. Very mm. unusual. The possibility that they were deliberately placed there is strengthened by the fact that they appear to have been accompanied by grave goods. This is similar to pins which have been found in Neolithic and Bronze Age burial mounds in Derbyshire. It's very difficult to typologically date bone artefacts. The techniques of bone working yeah, haven't really similar. changed for 10,000 years. Because they work so well. Yeah. <laughs> yes. But you'd see that going with the, the skulls and the long bones down here. I think so. It's a decorative item. Yeah. And what do you think this is? This is a very curious artifact. Yeah, it's obviously antler. There is a theory that the function of these was that you could use them to strip the hairs off the hide of uh, ah, animals nice, like cattle nice. because yeah. you can catch the hairs in these little grooves yeah. Yeah. and rip them out. Cool. That's what it is. Stone Age Imac. <laughs> <laughs> There's something like two and a half thousand years between our oldest Neolithic bones and our newest Iron Age ones but there's no evidence of funeral practices from the Bronze Age, the 1500 years between the Neolithic and Iron Ages. 400 metres from the cave is a lump in the ground, which the archaeologists think could be a Bronze Age burial mound or barrow, and if it is, it would fill the gap. A barrow would usually be off limits, but we can dig this one because local rumour has it that there's been unofficial excavation into the mound. Our primary goal is to find out the extent of the damage. Phil and Mike Parker Pearson have made a start clearing the mound, and they've already found the probable marks of the robber trench from 1983. That's the buried turf yeah. from 83. And look, if you follow it along, you can see where this has been cut straight through these. So that's the edge of the trench right here. The rubber trench isn't proof that the mound is a barrow, but in case it is, it gives us a way in while minimising new damage. Half an hour after arriving in the cave, Katie and Alice are finding that Yorick is littered with human bones. Yeah. 
that looks like a human elbow to me. To Just to be a bit more specific, it's the bottom end of the humerus on the right hand uh -huh. side. We now need to get the bones to the surface, cleaned up and more closely examined to see if they complete our prehistoric puzzle. Just finding more bones doesn't tell us how they got here. They might have been dumped or even moved by animals, rock falls or water and mud flows. So there's uh, some neonate skull. Neonatal being... Uh, being newborn baby. baby, yeah. Clusters of bones will be more promising especially if they're delicate and undamaged. Careful recording by measuring off fixed points on the walls will pinpoint whether they're in clusters. Because we're 15 metres underground, the spoil can't be hauled out of the chamber, so Katie and Alice can only move rocks around from one spot to another. Archaeologists believe that in different periods in prehistory, there were very different ways of disposing of the dead. Well, in the Neolithic, before 2500 BC, they're basically getting bodies turned into bone. And there seem to be two main ways in which you do that. You leave them out to get pecked by the birds, or you actually take a flint tool and you strip the flesh off. Now, after 2500, we get bodies being popped into the ground whole and a round barrow built over the top. And after that in the Iron Age? It's very hard to say. We find cremations, we find inhumations, we find bits of bone. And they turn up in all kinds of places, in settlements, in houses, in fields. But by and large, we don't know where the vast majority of the population is being disposed of or how. And what about the cave? We have two very interesting groups there. We've got the man who's had his legs cut off. Yeah. He's very unusual. We've not had anyone with their knees sliced through. And why is he in the cave? Why has he not been put in a barrow? And he may be just one part of the population that's not getting this particular treatment. And what about the little babies? Again, they're very unusual. From a period when we have very few burials, there's about a dozen of them. What are they all doing in that cave? We hope our two sites will tell us a huge amount about how the dead were treated around here in prehistory, and it's looking good. Yorick's producing plenty of bones, and in Flaccid, the chamber which produced the Roman coins and pottery but very few bones, Anise is getting very excited. Hello, Anise to Alice. Hi, I'm um, calling from Flaccid. Um, I think we may have some in from the remains here that you might want to look at. Excellent. I'll get them tugged up and I'll be in. OK. Flaccid's full of mud, which has to be laboriously hauled out by our human conveyor belt. Up five metres through a narrow, slippery shaft, 20 kilos of spoil at a time has to be dragged from the coal face to the surface. It then needs to be carefully sieved for small bones or artefacts. Down where? Well, your foot is more or less. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Alice comes in and trashes the outfit. Um, the mandrel's the down there if you want to drop okay. down here. Yeah, this is a human jawbone. We haven't got any of the teeth left in it, but it actually looks, I would say, I'd like to see it cleaned up, but I would say that that was an older adult. Older? Um, oh, we've right. in fact lost some of the teeth there. Oh, right. But it would be nice to get that cleaned up. Hey. So both chambers are delivering more human bones. And in Yorick, we think we might now be able to get at the infant's skull lying under the metal plate in the rocky scree. But until that's stabilised, then we could look at the skull that's under this plate and the one that's being looked at now. Come out, come out, come out, come out. We shouldn't. Just go back to see what's happening. Knock it off. What's yeah. happening is that there's still nothing doing here. 
Up at the mound, they're flying along. Phil, you're really hitting this fast, aren't you? <laughs> well, we didn't really have a, a problem in, in deciding where to dig, Tony, because you could actually see where on the barrow they'd actually put a, a trench in before and actually could see the backfill. Who's they? Who are these people? Someone who dug the barrow out nearly 20 years ago. We don't know what was found and uh, hopefully we'll get some idea of what he was digging through. There could be lots of skeletons, cremated bones as well. Uh, there may be disarticulated, broken up bodies underneath this. So it's like a, a big cemetery, but a round one. And of course it may have started very simply as a very low monument, a cairn of stones, and then with all the soil heaped up over the top. So it could be very complicated. But then again, it may be very simple. It may not even be a barrow. Phil and Mike are going to continue onward, ever downward. Encouragingly, the spoil from Flaccid is now beginning to reveal human bones, though so far, no artefacts. And now, at last, just at the end of day one in Yorick, the promising rocky scree has been stabilised so Katie and Alice can get at it. Tony to Katie. Hello. What have you got down there? Well, we're just finding some skulls. And they look like they're baby skulls, don't they, Alice? Yeah, we've got a few pieces of what look like um, more neonate, so newborn baby skull. It's extremely thin. And there's lots of other little bones as well, including the clavicle, which is my favourite, so I'm very pleased about that. The other thing we've got is um, what looks as though it may be an adult skull in the sort of rocks behind the baby skull. The only thing is, is we've had quite a few rock falls in this chamber. That one? That one's alright, yeah. OK, I'm going to move this now and we should be able to see it's down oh, there. Can you see it now, Tony? That's where my torch is there. Oh yeah, I've got it, I've got it. And, and it looks like it's almost complete. Is it a human? It is definitely a human skull. Practically fully grown. OK, Tony, can you see the teeth there? Yeah. I think we're going to have to take it out quite soon because the rubble above it is very loose. But can you move it without causing a small avalanche? No, go away. Do you think we ought to do this tomorrow? Yes. <laughs> OK. <laughs> it's going to be an early start then, isn't it? Get out of there quickly now. Phil? Hello? I heard a voice. It's beginning of day two. Believe it or not, this is flaming June on the Derbyshire Dales, and Phil's digging a prehistoric barrow. There you are, mate. <laughs> I can just make out your foot. Well, well, as much as we can do to find this place this morning, I tell you. <laughs> you see, we, we spent yesterday taking out the backfill of our earlier barrow diggers, uh, and we've hit bedrock down there. Yeah. But look what we've got down here. When Mike was working in here, we've got some infant bones. And then over in this hole here, we've got yet more skull fragments just poking through the corner there. So you asked me yesterday, is this a barrow? <laughs> yes, it is definitely a barrow. Stuart, what on earth are you going to be able to do in this visibility? Yeah. Come here a minute. Look at his glasses, they're completely steamed up. <laughs> Are you going to be able to do anything in this place? Well, I'm going to attempt to. I mean, it's, it, today it's dreadful. I mean, you do need to see the landscape to interpret it, but I'm going to do my best. I've got some good news for you. I've got a special GPS <laughs> hat. If you wear this, this will signal where you are yeah. all the way back to the incident room. So oh, whatever happens great. today, put that on and you can't get lost. Oh, right. Does it come with batteries? <laughs> so you're going to know where I am the whole time, presumably. <laughs> where are you? <laughs> Found out already. <laughs> See you in a bit. While Stuart disappears into the murky landscape to find out where the people who were buried here originally lived, Phil's going to continue excavating the barrow. Down at the cave, there's a serious hold-up while emergency safety works carried out in Yorick. 
Yesterday's mini avalanche forced us to abandon the chamber just after we'd found another human skull. So Katie's now going into Flaccid, the gloopy Roman chamber. At the moment, our site's still cloaked in mystery. We can't say whether the cave and the barrow were used for different kinds of burial or just at different times. These round barrows date from the early Bronze Age. That's about 2,500 BC to 1,500 BC. Yeah. And below ground, dig a grave in the middle of what is then covered by this great mound of soil. But this is Derbyshire where they do things differently. So you have a kerb of stones. What was the kerb for? Well, the kerb defines a sacred space, a circular area into which human bodies may be brought. And then you put your bones maybe on the surface, maybe a few little burials in different places. And then the whole thing is covered with a great mound. Why do you put the bones on the surface? Well, we think what they're doing is exposing the dead. So on before some of you these put sites, the mound on. Before the mound goes on, yeah. So these bones are laid out and gradually the flesh rots off them and the bones stay there and are eventually covered up. That's it. And you may even come along and pick up the big bones and it's just the little bones that are left. And then sometime later somebody else comes along and possibly puts more graves in. That's right. So we get insertions like so popping some bodies in. You may even have a pot with ashes of the dead placed into the top of the mound. Work at the barrows steaming along. And Mike's barely had time to roll his sleeves up again oh, before this. Phil finds a cremation urn. Can I come and have a look, Phil? Yeah, mate, if you get down in that hole right. from where you are... Cheers. Oh. What have you got, then? We thought originally it might be something that they dug up in the 80s and kind of reburied. Mm. Yeah. But it's clearly now very much undisturbed. Right. Mm. And we've even got a little bit of cremated bone just here. Oh, yes, I can see that. It it's looks very like, thin, isn't it? It looks like a child's skull fragment. Oh, crikey, again. So it's another, another, one. another yeah. kid, yes. Is that the sort of pottery you'd expect a Bronze Age urn to be round here? Well, it looks Bronze Age. Yeah. What we're looking for is if there's any decoration on it, if we've got a rim, and whether yeah. it's uh, yeah. of a particular type or not. Mike, do you reckon the pot is the right way up, or is it inverted upside down? This looks to me like this is getting towards the bottom, and it's actually so, wide. So, we're, so we're, we're looking yeah. at it upside, upside down. down. Then. Yeah. This is untouched since the Bronze Age. So it's been broken, they've mixed it not just with the bones, but yeah. all of this black pyre material. Yeah. And they've just dug a hole and chucked it in. See, I mean, that's yeah. the other interesting yeah. thing about, about this cremation, because obviously when it was put in here, yeah. the mound, the barrow, was already there. Right. Mm. So right. God alone knows when it was actually constructed. Mm. Sure. This yeah. could this could be somewhere between what fifteen hundred and a thousand BC. Yeah. Something sort of like late that. Late-ish, mid mid to mid, late mid Bronze, to late Bronze Age. Bronze Age yeah. Yes. Who knows what else is in here? We're only on the surface. Phil wants to get the contents out and is also looking for something to date the urn, either a pattern carved into it or the rim. The cave seems to be getting gloopier and gloopier. You'd think we were taking mud in, not bringing it out. Within minutes of arriving in Flaccid, Katie's found buried treasure. Oh my god, it's like a brooch or something. It's incredible. That's going to look great when it's cleaned up. Stuart's groping his way through the foggy landscape, looking for any evidence of prehistoric settlements. Oh, he's just moved. Oh, he's just so, moved yeah. Yeah. so Stuart's there. He may not know where he is, but in the incident room we do, thanks to the GPS hat. If the mist doesn't lift, everyone on this dig's going to need GPS helmets. I've just found something that oh, you might right. be interested in. <laughs> it's amazing, I just found it just lying 
on, on the surface of the really? clay. Oh, it's very muddy. But yes. Oh, good. Look at that. It's a brooch, isn't it? Yes, it's Roman. And it's so beautifully preserved, you yeah, can even see, it's absolutely. like fresh metal yeah. there. It's, it's it might lovely. have been silvered originally, because they often were. But it's obviously a prize item. And there's, there's, this has come out of um, a whole load of uh, mud that had uh, Roman coins and a bit of Samian pottery as well. So right, we're so getting a pretty good... Second century, yeah, AD. Right. Yeah. Yet another Roman find. And it's looking increasingly likely that this cave was used for burials, not just in the Neolithic and Iron Ages, but in the Roman period as well. It seems extraordinary that our cave, which was probably hugely important for such a long time, was only rediscovered by the Pegasus cavers by chance. We came into this cave, which was just a simple chamber with a flat, muddy floor with no, no ways off anywhere in the chamber. So what did you see, Malcolm? Right, when I came into the chamber and uh, studied the lie of the rock, uh, noticed the watercourse was running down this fault line yeah. and goes to the weakest point, so I started digging in the floor. So that was all covered in mud? That's right, up to this level. Well, we, we got down to uh, what we thought was cobbles and Andy was on a lifeline and next thing you know, I lost him. <laughs> the floor went. So you tumbled in? That's right, come face to face with some skulls. Skulls? That's right. One of them was uh, calcited actually onto the wall. So it was like frozen into the wall? That's right, yeah. So what did you do? I made a sharpish retreat. <laughs> <laughs> well, one of the frightening things was one of the first skulls we saw, it was a cranium, but on top of the cranium there was two inch growth of a, a boss stalagmite, which was really unusual, because it looked as though the skull had got a horn on the top of its head. And very close to it was a goat skull, and the position of the goat skull made that appear to have horns as well. And when we saw the fragments of infant cranium, circled around this animal school. It was really freaky. Child sacrifice. That's what, that was our initial thoughts. Mm. To, the, to the untrained eye, that's what it uh, looked as though it could be. Oh, it's a bit heavy. Yorick Chamber has now been reopened, and Alice has been joined by Andrew Chamberlain and Katie. The bad news is that the rock slope, which is stuffed with human bones, has been declared permanently off-limits. As you can see over here, this is where the, the skull was coming out and all those lovely bones uh, in a whole load of mud, but it was just getting so dangerous. We, I mean, we were having a lot of rockfalls. So that's all been bouldered up now, so it's, it's much safer. We're going to leave that area mm -hmm. totally now. No more neonatal. No more bones. bones. No more bones. I think it's better to live than find bones. Yes, it was <laughs> feeling slightly dangerous yesterday. So. Yeah. The good news is that we can still dig in the floor of the cave. And Andrew thinks that the bones found here are most likely to be where they were originally placed. <laughs> it's old, isn't it? I thought you said it was safe. Well, that's what it's for. That's what it's for. It's tested, isn't it? It's tested, yeah. It's full. That was like formation panic. Yes. Is anywhere in the cave safe? That rockfall was in a new place. The area where we can dig safely is now getting smaller and smaller. The barrow trench is now being extended, while Phil's working on lifting the cremation urn. It's slow and painstaking work. We're hoping that the rim is somewhere in there. Our site's intriguing, but there are still more questions than answers. Although after two days digging, we've probably increased the head count from 20 to 26, none of the bones has any useful distinguishing features like disease or cut marks, which would help to explain their presence in the cave nor have we found any artefacts that tie in with our known dates in the Iron Age or the Neolithic. The one artefact we have found, the beautiful Roman brooch, doesn't have a body definitely associated with it. What exactly have you got there, Phil? Well, I've got a magnificent burial urn here, Tony. This is the, the circumference of it. You can see all the pieces of pot standing on edge coming right the way round there. So it's a pot that big across you can see that the actual quality of the pot is very badly fired. 
You can see it's not in very good condition. Here we go. There we go. Well done, mate. Magnificent stuff, though, isn't it, eh? The cave isn't going to give up its secrets so willingly. As the safe area of Yorick gets ever smaller, Katie's been forced to hunt elsewhere for bones. She's now going to the third chamber. It's another five metres below Yorick, and just getting there is an extreme experience. Shouldn't have had so much breakfast. <laughs> Access is difficult but we're hoping that the reward will be more bones and artefacts. Does it get any wider? A bit. But it's not to be. The rocks are even more unstable here. I think it's far too dangerous to be down here moving yeah. stones. A bit claustrophobic, yeah? It is, yeah. I think we should just get out and okay. concentrate off in Yorick. All right. What was that? It's me, don't worry. Katie's now going back to Yorick to see if she can improve her luck there. Alice is already in Flaccid, our muddy chamber, where all the Roman finds have been made. Yeah. Alice? Hello. Oh, yeah. oh, it's like Walton Towers coming down here, isn't it? Yes, yeah, so you have to be a worm to get into this one. Uh, what have you got? I'm really excited. We've got lots and lots of human bones coming out here. It's, it's great. Um, we've got uh, human femur here. It's all sticking together with mud, look. There's a human femur, but we'll clean it up a bit later. Adult human femur, got some um, fragments of adult skull there, and that's an adult um, a vertebra, one yeah. from the lower back, the lumbar one. But we've also got, again, child remains. Isn't this weird? It's really strange. Can you see Can you see this bit here? Yeah, yeah. oh, I'm getting pretty familiar with those. That's yeah. the child's skull, isn't it? It is, yeah. And that's just the side of your head there, um, where, your, where your ear is. In fact, the, the ear hole is somewhere there on the outside. So that is, that is part of a child's skull again. And there's a few more fragments there, and they're very closely associated with that um, adult femur there. So whether they were sort of buried at the same time, the trouble is there's been so much movement in the cave that we can't really say that. Now we've got infant bones in both chambers, but with no distinguishing features or artefacts, mystery of why human bones are in cave still unsolved. Mystery of animal bones in cave sorted. You've got wild boar, goat, in this case, covered in stalagmite, really thick stalagmite. Oh, this, is, this isn't part of the skull? No, 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 this is stalagmite that's formed on the surface of the, the skull as it was presumably lying on the cave floor. This bit here's the bone? Yeah. And there's stalagmite. Yeah. And then slightly more exotic things like bear. A lovely arm bone of a bear, uh, an animal that you might expect to be in a cave. What's this big thing here? Oh, that's one of the most spectacular things. Absolutely beautifully preserved as well. This is an aurochs. Whatever's that? It's a wild cow. It's a cow about the size of a rhino. And uh, we believe this particular bone is about 6,000 years old. So this is forming the sort of far end of the assemblage here. How do you reckon they got in the cave? I think they just dropped in. What do you mean? I think these are animals that were feeding around the edge of a a shaft into the cave and they've just lost their footing and dropped in. Isn't it more likely that people were killing them and then dragging them in the cave to eat them? No, I don't think so, because there's, there's no evidence on the bones of the kind of activities that we would have expected to take place. There's no evidence of bone smashing for marrow extraction and there's certainly no butchery marks on the bones. These are complete bones in many cases. Could they have been for sacrifice? I don't think so. It doesn't work. You've got a far too big a range of animals here. So people weren't killing and cooking them? No. Nope. And they weren't killing them for ritual reasons? No, this is the kind of thing that's probably still going on now. Well, that's two theories you've knocked on the head. Thank you very much. <laughs> There's a surprise inside Phil's cremation urn. Oh, crikey, that's moved on a lot, hasn't it? <laughs> We're really pleased now. We've actually got down to the reason this pot was put in the ground. We've actually got the main deposit of cremated bone. Oh, yeah, I can see And look, we have got... Vast 
chunks of, well, partially cremated bone. But it's very thin, isn't yeah, it? It's a child. So it's a child again. Yeah. It's, it's not a newborn child, presumably. No, no it's uh, several years old. God. Yeah, but I mean, yeah. we, we could have several bodies in here, couldn't it's we? A, yeah, yeah, it's big enough. Yeah, it, yeah it's a, a big pot. And have we got any of the rim of this pot yet? No, I mean, that is the big problem. Broadly, we're looking at a pot that's somewhere between about 2000 and 1500 BC. Right. But the rim will really help us to narrow it down yeah. better. Mm -hmm. But it's just extraordinary. All those sheds, not one piece. That, that's the frustrating Again, thing, really, yeah, isn't it? Yeah, and that's making me wonder whether they've collected together bits of broken vessels right. and put them right. in here, right. rather than the complete one that's collapsed on it. Because that is going to be the most diagnostic well, piece of the pool, yeah. isn't it? That's really yeah. what we need to see. At the moment, there's confusion about which way up the pot is. If it's upside down, the rim may still be down there. But we're nearly halfway through day three and there's lots more work to do. Down in Yorick, Katie's like a dog that's lost its bone. She's digging like a maniac wherever she can. Unfortunately, there are no bones and no artefacts. As for the sieving, there must be an easier way to collect rocks. The barrow trench has reached rock bottom, literally. So this is the limestone bedrock before the barrow is built, That's in right. fact, yeah. What we call a natural. Yeah, and on top of that, is this, which is a buried soil. Right. So this would have been turf and a certain amount of soil, really quite thin. So this would, this would have had a soil and grass over the top, mm, yeah, originally. But, but not yeah. very deep by the looks of it at all, right. maybe with one or two stones poking up. So they then come along and build the barrow. They and come along and build the barrow. What's the sequence with that? And then we have a clay mound. Right. And against that, we have a series of turfs, and you can see they're different oh, colours yes. of orange mm. and brown, and they've been stacked up to form a curb or a perimeter to the edge of the barrow. And then they finally cover it with this stuff, which is a very nice soft brown loam. Right. And that comes right up over the top. And it's into this that Phil's cremation has been dug. And so, that's the final act. Right, so it's a three-stage construction mm. to it. Small mound to start with, turf's added, yes. and then the whole thing covered over and cremation's put in the top. In a nutshell. That's fantastic. Yeah, very nice. Despite having had to stumble around in the mist, Stuart thinks he's worked out where the people who used the cave lived. He's now in the valley below our cave. So I think we're actually sitting on the slopes here of a late prehistoric Iron Age uh, community with two or three groups of, of roundhouses down here with paddocks and yards with yeah. animals in, yeah. fields with crops growing down yeah. on the soil. Presumably here. below the slope, steep slopes all the way exactly. around. Exactly, so it's, it's, it's our entire world in yeah. this valley, but in terms of the cave, if you look over the hill there, so that's where the cave is, yeah. well look at the profile, if you follow it along, it starts to drop, drop down, yeah. get that depression there, then it rises up ever so slowly towards where the cave is, where the two aerials and, yeah. and tents are there. So what you've actually got from here is a profile where you can actually see the cave on the highest point of that, of that ridge. Yeah. But the other really interesting aspect about this valley is, of course, that you can't see the other barrow. No. It'd be over no. where that, that ruined cottage is over there. The barrow would have been on the ridge bit of, behind that ridge over there. Yeah. You can't see it from this settlement at all. No. The cave will serve the community in this valley, yeah. and I'll bet you a pound to a penny when we look over the hill the other side, yeah. the barrow serves the community in the next valley. Yeah. And sure enough, 4,000 years ago, this would have been the view from the neighbouring valley, with the barrow beautifully skylined. Meanwhile, the osteologists have been hard at work and noticed that a number of the skulls from Yorick Chamber have a peculiar characteristic in common. What do you reckon to that? Is it human? It is. 
Is that an eye socket? Yeah, it certainly is. Then why has it got this strange jutting? <laughs> that's, that's the interesting <laughs> bit. That's its nose. That's bizarre. It's huge, isn't it? <laughs> Absolutely are, massive. Those are the nasal bones, which are the, the bones right at the top of your nose that you break if somebody punches you in the face. And that is just... It's a huge nose. They're really, really jutting out. So what do they look like when they haven't got big noses? Um, this skull is probably um, the most sort of normal, as it were, if you can say a nose is normal. Can you see that that's a much more gentle curve there? So if you sort of compare those together, you can see that the, the nose of this individual is going to be um, much less prominent than that one there. You say they're big. Yeah. What would they actually have looked like? Pretty massive, and um, we've been actually working on a reconstruction, and we've been using um, cutting-edge technology to produce something real sort of state-of-the-art. And I've got it here. It would have looked something like that. <laughs> <laughs> something like... <laughs> no! <laughs> Andy, is there any significance about the fact that so many of them have got big noses? Well, it probably suggests that quite a few of these people are related to each other. You're kidding. Yeah. So we've got a family of big-nosed people. And, in fact, there are other things as well. We've had things like double-rooted canines in some of the mandibles, and that suggests, yeah, kinship, a closeness, a familial relationship. Well, that's a twist to the story, isn't it? We've got a whole lot of big-nosed relatives being buried in that cave. Yeah. Up at the Barrow, it's been a race against time to see if we could reveal the rim of the cremation urn, which might allow us to date it. After two days of painstaking scraping, Phil thinks he's finally found it. OK, so this is the body of the pot coming down here to the shoulder. Yep. And then it comes on down to the neck there. The neck is, is the concave piece. What, this whole bit in yeah, here? Yeah, yeah. So that's the neck there, then? Yeah. And it may be the concave neck, steeply concave neck of a collared urn. Well, actually, I mean, I think if I... Yeah, I can oh. actually get my you can, can't toothpick you? underneath so there's there. There's that no is, collar. That is the end of the pot. Yeah. It probably is biconical rather than collared. There isn't enough depth there for a collar. This biconical urn turns out to be quite a find. Only one other example has ever been found in the Peak District. This one would have been made specially for the cremation around 1000 BC, towards the end of the Bronze Age, by which time the barrow may have been 1000 years old. We'll take that box there, then uh, I think we'll just call it a day. Okay, okay. Yorick Chamber remains a mystery. Everyone's convinced that the unstable rocks in here are hiding more human bones, but they've guarded their secrets jealously, in spite of our heroic attempts to get at them. Are you surprised that there's so many skeletons of young children in that cave? Yeah, I'm a bit surprised. But I'm not surprised that the skeletons have actually survived because it is, after all, a bone cave. What do you mean a bone cave? Well, it's the kind of place where bone survives for many thousands of years and the people living in this area would have observed those bones and it would be a natural place to put other bones. It's a heck of a way to go. How did they get to where they got to? I think they must have been carried in by other people. Um, there are no chewing marks on these infants' bones. They're not being dragged in by wild animals. Mm -hmm. And so to get that far down into the cave, they had to be carried in, either as bodies placed on the floor of the cave to decay, or perhaps they'd already become skeletons yeah. somewhere else and were brought in as bundles of bones. So this could just be a cave where, when little children died, they were brought to and laid out? It looked like everybody was laid out down there. It's just that there were a lot of children. So we can go some way towards explaining the Iron Age babies in Yorick. The question now is, what was going on in Flaccid? Now that our best find, the beautiful brooch, has been added to the other Roman finds from the chamber, Kai thinks she's got the answer. Oh, this yes. is a nice, beautiful find. Cool. This is what they call a trumpet-headed brooch. Um, it's either made of silver or it's been silvered or tinned on the surface, which is yeah. why it's quite shiny. Right. And it would have been worn as one of a pair, worn like this, with a silver chain oh, between right. them. This is a high-status find and the sort of thing that's often found with female Roman burials. Right. Um, this dates to the middle, probably, of the 2nd century. 
Um, so it's a bit later than the coins. The coins date from between the early 70s AD right through to about uh, AD 117. Um, and to me, this certainly looks like it could be associated with these. We, we could have um, a set of, in effect, grave goods. We've got a mortarium here for preparing food. Yeah. We've got part of a, a Samian ware drinking vessel, a wine cup, if you like. We've got some coins which may be heirlooms by the time this was deposited. Right. These could be helping a lady on her way to the afterlife. Right, right. After three days, we can say conclusively that our cave was used for the ritual deposition of humans. Most recently, there was a Roman burial, perhaps as late as the second century. About 700 years before that, in the Iron Age, children were buried here, though we still don't know why. In the 1500 years before that, in the Bronze Age, the locals buried their dead in the barrow, either after cremation or excarnation, where they were laid out to rot. More than 4,500 years ago, around the end of the Neolithic period, the cave was used to bury the bones of a man whose legs had been cut off, disarticulated. More broadly, we can say that this ridge in Derbyshire was used for burials for nearly 3,000 years, using different bits, in different ways, at different times. <laughs>